All right, good morning, guys. Let's get started. Somehow it's eight o'clock, even though it feels like six still. Happy uh, four day work week, everybody. This is nice, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I hope everyone had a good weekend, good first week. Um, hopefully, it can only feel like the weeks are going to go by quicker now instead after that first long week of our lives. Um, any questions so far on Canvas and everything? I mean, it seemed like everybody was able to access it and do the quiz and stuff. Um, or sorry, the introduce yourself thing. That's the quiz. Do the exam. We're always so hard to practice. Yeah. 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 I don't remember being a <laughs> Well, sweet. Um, we're going to just chug along. We're going to start introducing uh, soil today, since that's what geotechs study a lot. Um, so today's going to be a, a soil overview. A few reminders. Um, we still don't have lab this week, so we're going to start that up next week. So next Tuesday. The, you know, we'll, the Tuesday crew will come uh, right after this class and we'll go over to the lab. Um, so double check and contact your lab groups in the Canvas page. Sorry, this is not uploaded yet. I forgot to hit publish, um, but that will be published after this class. So you can log in there and then download the syllabus. Pretty much everything um, is going to be very similar, just structure of the course wise to the CE materials lab. Um, and the schedule is already shown in the other, other syllabus too. Uh, but be sure to contact your group members and uh, just double check too and make sure that you're in the correct one that you signed up for on Canvas, unless you've already talked to me and, and made that switch on that. All right, cool. Uh, today, yeah, we're gonna be introducing uh, uh, soil and geologic processes. Has anyone taken like a geology class here? I know they offer like some something like that. Okay, cool. So um, a lot of this stuff is gonna be taken kind of from that should be familiar. If you were ever in fifth grade, which I'm assuming most of you guys probably were, then a lot of this stuff is gonna be familiar from that. Um, but again, it, like you'll see throughout the semester, the geotech side is kind of unique because we overlap a lot with geology. Uh, we basically just put math towards geology things. Um, so it's important to at least get a, a little bit of a refresher background wise of the geologic processes and how that's going to play a role into ultimately the strength or the failure mechanism of that type of soil or something. So what we talked about yesterday, we kind of defined broadly what a geotechnical engineer is. Um, it's the science that explains the mechanics of the soil and the rock and its relationship to design. And that mechanics is the important part because that is what we assign math to. So this is all about taking a qualitative, like an observation of soil and rock, assigning the mechanics behind it. So putting math and understanding the quantitative structure behind it so we can then effectively design um, and distribute the loads in a construction or a design standpoint. So again, since we're working with soil and rock, we talked about all of that is rooted in natural material from the earth. Um, and uh, so there's an important aspect of uh, geology that we have to account for. Um, so although we're not geologists, um, a lot of geotechnical engineers still will have a background in geology. And you'll see if you ever start working as a geotechnical engineer, um, a lot of your reports that you provide the client will still have a background in geology um, just because they have cool maps and, and it, it looks good in the report. So geology and geotech, um, it is kind of similar, um, but the geotechnical engineer has to ultimately learn from the geologists to improve the design of the future structures. So the geology gives the engineer kind of these three main points that I, I'm going to summarize here. Um, it, they provide the insights on regional conditions. So this is important. The regional conditions. A geologist isn't going to be um, really caring about the southwest corner of beach in 295. You know, they provide a regional idea of the type of soil and rock 
or soil or rock, sorry, I should say, that is found in that area. So based off of the history, how that rock, how that soil got there, um, what type of deposit it is, a little bit on the mineralogy, which all plays a role and all is correlated to the strength um, that we'll see here in a little bit. So they also provide along the lines of that is the deposition slash what we'll refer to a lot and you'll see throughout the class, the formation. I don't know if they covered this in uh, geology, but geologist talks in broad soil terms of soil formations. Um, so the formation X in Florida, all deposited around the same age, it all deposited from a river. And so kind of most of the times it will all similarly have a, a identical strength or a failure mechanism that we have to worry about. So the geologists help that. But again, what this is, is a qualitative observation. So it's still important because they see the big picture and they see the um, time aspect, um, but it's just qualitative. It's based off of the history, the deposition of it. Um, it's not necessarily, there's no mechanics assigned to it. Um, the other important thing that geology gives the engineer um, would be potential geohazards. This is a big aspect of geotechnical engineering. Not only do we have to design an effective foundation or um, you know, any type of uh, structure out of the earth um, effectively that it won't fail in a local aspect, but we also have to consider and look out for potential geohazards like the ones I highlighted last week, the liquefaction of soils if an earthquake occurs, um, these massive landslides from quick clay conditions, or even just accidentally hitting a abandoned salt mine. You know, the geologist should have an idea of the un underlying conditions um, to, you know, to warn the engineer basically to look out for these. So some of these examples, obviously, we talked about last week is that liquefaction in Florida. A big one is sinkhole vulnerability. But then also floods too. So underlying areas, the soil does play a big role into the flooding potential, not only the elevation, but how much um, you know, void spaces in the soil. If it's a clay and water just drains off the top of it, um, the geologist would be able to identify some of these too. And sorry, I just remembered that this is here. <laughs> so um, basically all geotechnical reports will start with a geologic background. And you'll see that whenever we start reviewing some examples of reports, um, they will provide the geologic formation. They'll provide a geologic map generally, um, and then a basic insight of what you'll find regionally. So again, this is a regional condition. And then the, the geotechnical engineer will look specifically at the project site and do an invest, investigation at the project site. So if you're familiar with um, geology at all, you'll probably recognize some of these words. Um, geologists like to view the life of the earth um, on a geologic time scale. That's much different. So they divided the age of the earth, which according to them is about 46 million years or 4,600 million years. They divided into these four units of age. So eons, eras, periods, and epochs. So these are equivalent to like saying seconds, years, months, just on a long scale. So these are units of age and scales. Um, and they would look something like this. And you've probably heard of like the Jurassic period, right, from Jurassic Park. Um, other things, the Holocene, which was like a Bon Iver, Bonivar, whatever that guy's name is. He had an album about that. So some of these words are like familiar, um, but they all have a specific meaning um, that are a little bit hard to grasp. So I just want to show in today's scale, this is like a kind of a dumb thing that's kind of outdated now, but in smartphone scale, I got my first smartphone in 2012. I was super stoked about it. It was a Android back in the Android days. But anyways, in smartphone scale, it'll look a little different. So the Phanerozoic would be 10 years ago. So like that equivalent here where we see the eons being, sorry, an eon is about, yeah, 
525 million years ago. That's what an eon is. So that's like the, the length of time. An era is about 65 million years ago. And MYA, I'll put up here. Million years ago. The period was about 2.6 million years ago. And then the epochs, 0.01 million years ago. So again, if we were talking, squeezing this into just a 10 or 12 year scale, um, then the Phanerozoic would be 10 years. So that would be 10 years long. So that's our largest extent. That a relative era to that would be just 14 months. And that would be the Cenozoic era. The periods would be 12 days. And then that epoch, even though it's equivalent to 0 0.01 million years ago, that would have been like two hours ago. So when I was waking up and pouring coffee to come here. So like and we're talking about in relative terms, if you see these words, they all just seem like fancy big words, but really like we're talking about a large scale difference um, in the formation of the soil and the rocks in, um, in Florida. So for example, like you'll see this here, this as we go down in this graph, we get further and further away from present day. Um, just for like reference, most of Florida, the oldest like rock that we'll find really in Florida, like for geotechs are right about here in the EOC. Um, and you can see though, some of these things, if you work out in Arizona or one of these areas where you have these like larger and older um, periods, then you may have rock from different types of eras here. But generally for us in Florida, we'll stick mainly in the Cenozoic era. We won't push into the Mesozoic. Um, so today, just like how today we can say it is January 18th at 8.12. Today, we could also say, if you want to geek out with a geologist friend, you could say today we are in the Phanerozoic Eon, the Cenozoic Era, the Quaternary Period, and then we are currently in the Holocene Epoch. So again, these right here are the units, and then this is the name. These these ones are the names, or the titles. So what we would call those are the ages of that. Again, this isn't too important, but eventually, if you're in a branch of engineering that works with geologists, they're going to be giving you reports, and you're going to be given. They're going to try to impress you and make you feel isolated by saying these words. And it'd be good to at least be able to communicate with them. Um, like engineers do not have to worry about specializing in geologists, but we do have to at least worry about communicating with them effectively. So quaternary periods, so soils in, or sands in Florida um, have a specific type of deposition usually, um, anything within the quaternary period. Uh, so like geologists will commonly refer to like this type of sand in a riverbed as a quaternary sand. And now you know that, okay, they're talking about a relatively younger anywhere in the Pliocene or the Holocene sediment there. Um, so yeah, again, like I, I bring up the example um, of Florida because there's a few key things that happened in geologic age that really define the soil formations in Florida. Um, one of them first being if we zoom in only on the Cenozoic era, so don't worry about all the older stuff. We're just talking about 65 million years ago. Um, right here, in, right in between the Pliocene and the Pleistocene, we have what is the max glacial extent in North America. Um, and we can still see evidence of this geologically today, um, especially if you work anywhere up here in the North Midwest. I don't know why this is still called the Midwest, but anyways, up in Minnesota, Ohio and stuff, if you end up working up there, you'll see Ohio and Indiana and Illinois is pretty much split in half geologically um, because a long, long time ago, the glaciers actually stopped right there. So anything south of this dotted line had no glaciers, anything north of it had glaciers. And obviously that affects the geology completely, which would affect how the soils behaved. Um, so at this extent here, the different glacial advances, um, obviously that's the max extent 
Um, so we do see a very clear distinction in like the geologic map of, of Ohio or any of those northern states. Um, but if we keep going a little bit further in the, the Eocene and the Pliocene um, in 55 million years ago, this was important because this is Florida was underwater back then. Florida landmass emerges in the Oligocene, and then it goes underwater again. So just throughout this extent of glacial, um, you know, changes in the climate and everything, Florida landmass arises and then it goes under and then it comes back up, and that greatly affects our limestone buildup and other depositions that we see in Florida. Um, so just to show like a little helpful map right here. So this is what it, Florida looked like. Um, in the um, Eocene here, and then in the Miocene, this was the only landmass above right here. That's why, like, if you ever grew up in this part of Florida and, like, the rivers, you can find a bunch of massive shark's teeth and meg megalodon shark teeth in that area. That's because in this time in the Miocene, that was all shallow, and it was the shark, like, breeding ground, and then they lost their teeth for some reason. Anyways. So this is a very important thing that if you work in Florida, you will eventually have to work with this type of soil formation that formed during this time. And this is called the Hawthorne group. So due to this soil or this uh, phenomenon of the Florida landmass emerging into a shallow sea, all of this silt and quartz rich sand eventually settling down in the shallow sea, we have this clay formation that's called the Hawthorne group of soils. That's where all the phosphate mines are down there, all like the heavy metals and all the fossils and all that stuff. But it's also very hard to characterize and very hard to design against. Um, so, and it's strictly because of this. And we can see based off of this ridge right here in central Florida, anything to the left of it is going to be problematic. Anything to the right of it is going to have a different geologic formation where this Hawthorne group of soil is less prevalent. Um, so because of this, you know, just understanding geologic map and where that dividing line is in Florida, then at least you have a baseline information or understanding of what to expect when you're actually investigating in that area. So this is just one of the examples. Um, you can, you know, USGS or the Florida Geologic Survey has a lot of information on the different types of formations that us as engineers will see um, and how they were formed over geologic time. But this one's probably the most prevalent one, that Hawthorne group. And we'll be referencing this uh, throughout the semester too. I'll try to get some samples for us to, to work on it in the lab as well. So kind of bigger picture um, with the geologic formations, um, who remembers like the rock cycle? Does anybody remember that? Did anyone watch like a really creepy like 90s video on the rock cycle with people dressed up as rocks? Or was that just me in Florida? I gotta find it, but it's gonna be real, like it's really freaky. Like I'm, it would never be played today. It's like Bill Nye, but then this is like an extreme version of Bill Nye. Anyways, it's burned in my memory now, thanks to my my uh, Miss Shannon, my second grade teacher, but um, it's, it's, you know, at least it like we need to understand like the types of uh, the geologic formations um, again. So this is probably very familiar to everybody. We have igneous rock. This is the rock that is the crystallization of magma, right? So um, although we have lots of different types of igneous rock, the two like probably extreme examples that we've seen is the very dense rock and that's like our granite. So this is a very tight knit crystal structure. And with that, it is a very strong rock. Um, remember when we were talking about aggregates in CE materials, um, the granite aggregate is one of the strongest aggregates. That's why they use it for railroad ballasts and everything. Um, and that is because of the crystalline structure of that quick cooling magma. Um, on the other end, we have a very light or a less dense version, and this would be our pumice, like pumice or what Home Depot calls it, lava rock, right? We've all probably seen this stuff, like had it in your garden, and when it floods, it all floats up um, to the surface and stuff. So it's the same type of rock. It still comes from the result of a volcanic reaction and the crystallization of magma, and the simple differences of the mineralization pre prevalent, but then also the rate at which it cools 
or the gases that are within it can produce two completely separate strength rocks, right? We can all probably picture the lava rock or a pumice. You could just, you know, crush it, throw it against the wall and it would break where a granite sample would have a lot higher of a strength. We'll see that similarly too with sedimentary rock. Um, this is the sed cementation of erosional debris. So um, the majority of the rock, actually all the rock basically in Florida that we'll see is a sedimentary rock. Um, and again, this is where the environment is really important. And this is, instead of environment, what I'm gonna say is this, yeah, the debris. So the depositional, sorry. So how it got to where it was before it was squished into a rock. Um, so for example, like limestone in Florida, although it doesn't look like a sedimentary rock because you don't see these cool little lines like you do out like in out west in the Grand Canyon and stuff. Limestone is a sedimentary rock because it is a bunch of organisms and calcites and dead organisms that eventually in a shallow sea that were squished and formed into a rock. So it's a sedimentary rock. Um, if we know anything about limestone, we see it's a very weak rock where compared to some of the sedimentary rock you see out in Arizona or out west, you know, those like really pretty like painted deserts and stuff. Um, that's obviously going to be a stronger rock because it is has is a little bit more of an age. So again, the deposition process is going to be really important for that. The other one that we see um, is the metamorphic rock. Of course, this is more so based off of the minerals. Um, it, it's the igneous rock or the sedimentary rock that is just at a super high pressure and it almost condenses the rock into its original mineral state. So um, some that we'll see in Florida, uh, marble, and this is sometimes called chert, chert rock. Put it there. I shouldn't have used that color because it's hard to see. Sorry about that. So chert rock, um, other stuff, just something you'll probably see around if you ever go to Yosemite. That word, does anyone know how to pronounce that word? Yeah, it's nice. That's it. Again, they just like to confuse us and try to make us look silly in meetings and call it good nice, but that's just pronounce nice. So um, again, where you work or where you end up like, you know, having a project, you're going to encounter one of these broad categories of, of rock, maybe, you know, like, or you could just be working in complete soil. Um, but what we'll see is even the soil is a result of this rock that's being broken down um, into a finer grain rock and then mixed with other things. So for the soil aspect, the soil is actually the mixture of weathered rock with organic matter, nutrients, water, and air. And I know there's probably, you've probably heard at least of this stigma that geotechnical engineers don't like the word dirt. I will say it's it's true. Like I'm not a big stickler of it, but mainly it's Florida, Georgia called dirt um, that they kind of ruined it for me, but it is called soil. So when you start working with geotechnical engineers, whatever discipline you're in, call it soil um, and don't call it dirt. And they'll just look at you weird and talk weird behind you, behind your back, but that's it. Um, so for the, um, what soil is made of again is the composition of that weathered rock. So that's why it's important to understand how that rock was formed, how it was eroded or weathered into the finer, smaller particles, and then what it's mixed with, because that's what soil is composed of. So there's two main types of weathering um, that gets us from the rock form to the soil form. Um, you can probably guess the first one is physical. The second one is chemical weather. Florida specifically, we see a lot of both. Um, physical weathering would be like wind or water. It could also be abrasion. Anyone think of like what an abrasion, what type of abrasion may form, or may form, um, what source of like geologic phenomenon may form an abrasive, um, what type of weathering? 
that's like the glaciers like that we were talking about what a glacier is even though it doesn't look like it's moving it's a massive just like you know front loader basically that's pushing this material so there's a lot of abrasive weathering that's a big one of course we don't have to worry about that here but still we could have slipping of sediment on top of each other like a very slow moving landslide where this type of geologic formation above is sliding above another one and that's grinding the rock underneath it and forming a soil. Um, chemically um, weathering is really important in Florida. This would be like due to acidic groundwater. When I say acidic, really it could be very lightly acidic. Like we're not saying like something that's gonna like burn your skin even just picking up of carbon dioxide, like in the soil layer, just boosting the acidity just a little bit. If we're talking about over geologic time, um, that could eventually erode and, um, you know, cause these, these caverns and in the limestone in Florida, that's what we see a lot. So the, it could be from the groundwater. So I already said the water here, it could be from rain and it could be from like heating the soil of that. So the big one here that, that helps Florida, but is also a headache, this is the dissolution of limestone. Has anyone been to like springs in Florida and the springs around here? So those are all a, a result of the limestone bedrock being infiltrated with slightly acidic groundwater. And then over time that groundwater eroding chemically the limestone and forming these cavities that allow water to pass through it. Obviously, as it erodes and more water is allowed to pass through it, then the erosion occurs quicker. So then that's how we get these caves and um, other types of like large things that cave divers can go in and stuff. Um, similarly, like in some areas of Florida, like Suwannee and stuff where there is um, limestone at the surface, you'll see all this limestone looks like a bunch of like little pockets in them like it's called scalloping and that's just because of the rain even the rain hitting the limestone will erode it away over time um, physically and chemically so this is a really big thing in florida that we have to account for um, so that's the the weathering side of things there's also a certain term that you'll see a lot and that's the post weathering so the post weathering is after that rock has been either chemically or um, physically weathered or eroded, then we care about the transportation. So how it got to its current state that it's in. So the weathered parent rock within the present location, if it is not moved at all, then what we have is called, sorry, this should be a, this is what's called residual, let me write it up here, residual soil. So this is when it has not transported anywhere. So what we see is like, imagine if we have just a limestone block, it rains, whatever, that's a cloud. It rains on this limestone rock, limestone rock erodes, and then all that material that was eroded eventually gets smaller and smaller fine grains, and then it just stays where it is and what we have is called residual soil. So we have this in Florida. And this is what we get when we have limestone and then weathered limestone, and then what we call lime silts. So if you ever do a project in Florida, you'll probably definitely see these three terms somewhere. Weathered limestone for sure, but the extreme version of that is the lime silt. So it has eroded in place and stuck there near its parent rock, near the, in its present location. Um, and this is important because it has a similar chemical structure, but obviously a completely different physical structure. So it's going to have weaker, or it's going to have weaker um, characteristics, and not have, hold nearly as much strength. And of course, this occurs over time, but we're starting to be able to capture that, you know, as we're starting to monitor sites a little bit longer and understand how the erosion is occurring um, within a certain project site. So we have residual soils, and that is for um, soils that were not transported. But we also have 
different types of transported soils where it is not in its current location. So um, transportation method, it could be wind. Wind could just blow sediment over and take it from one parent rock to a different area, like in a valley or something. That type of sediment name, so if it's transported by wind, that is will produce what we call aeolian sediment. So again, all of these words, how they're referred to here would be, this would be aeolian sediment. And if a geologist comes and tells you, okay, we have primarily aeolian sediment at your site, um, then you know that all of this sediment was transported by wind. Um, and you can probably imagine like transported by wind, just kind of picked up and put down. So it's not like compacted at all. It's going to generally be uh, very loose and you're probably gonna have to densify it. Um, if it is transported by sea for a salt water condition, then what we have, this one at least is really easy. This one is called marine sediment. Again, I'm just gonna put, this word sediment is gonna be placed for all of these going down. So marine sediment, that Hawthorne group of soil that we were talking about that you'll see throughout the semester is a pain in Florida. That is a marine sediment that has salt like water embedded within it. And that affects the chemical characteristics and it also affects the, uh, the strength of it as well. Um, if we have a lake or freshwater, what we call here, this is, let me make sure I spell it right, lacustrine. So it kind of looks like lake you know, Lake Lacustrian. So this is a freshwater. So some of these lakes in Florida um, that are really, really old and we eventually get that deposition or that silt on the bottom of the lake that eventually gets squeezed into more of a soil. That is what we would call our Lacustrian. And this generally will have a really high water content because it was born in the lake, and, you know, like stayed in the lake, never dried. For rivers, what we would see is this is called fluvial or it's called alluvial. So for this class, there were just, these would be considered the same, fluvial or alluvial. And what it's called is then alluvium. So this is again, flowing rivers. Um, so a lot of the, there's another, a certain geologic formation in Florida that you would come across that is an alluvial sediment from the St. John's River. You know, So the St. John's has been going for a while. Um, so we know that this, type of depositional process will provide certain characteristics and certain things that we have to look out for uh, for the soil. Things that, the other ones that we don't really have to worry about, this one, glacial, I already just kind of talked about this. In other states, this glacial deposit is, is really um, a headache because again, as I said, like you can picture glaciers as just like a, a massive, uh, like a front loader, a big skid steer that just pushes everything. So these glacial deposits will have just a mix of all sorts of stuff. You could have massive boulders the size of cars um, and then a lot of like fine grain soil. So it's a really just well mixed soil and it's hard to investigate and it's hard to characterize because it's just mixed up a lot. So glacial soils are something that you come across. Um, another name for this would be moraine. So that could be something that a geologist would say moraine. Best way to remember that, that lake in, uh, what is it, Banff? Does anyone know Banff? You've probably seen like Instagram posts or something if Instagram's still a thing, but it's like that really pretty lake in, in uh, Banff with, it's a glacial lake and it's called Lake Moraine. So moraine is also the name for um, the glacial deposits. And then the other one, gravity, which we do not have in Florida because that requires hills this would be, sorry, colluvial. And these again, just like aeolian, this is only gravity. So like sediment falling down a hill and just stacking up at the bottom. It's not really compressed because it's just being like layered by gravity. Um, there's no other like water involved or anything. Um, so colluvial deposits will usually come with additional set of headaches because you have to densify this material before you can build it onto it or anything like that. So these, again, like I don't expect you guys to memorize these for the tests or anything, um, but I at least want you to understand like kind of the, um, to be able to recognize them. So you, 
yeah, so you won't need to like remember exactly Aeolian, but obviously, hopefully you can remember that Aeolian sounds like air is wind. So if you were given Aeolian, you could match that with the um, type of transportation method. So for um, the soil, just again, just, just regardless of how it got to the site or what type of deposition it is, um, we'll see that there's different categories and different like languages that are used to classify the soil. Um, and we'll get into that when we start talking about soil classification. Um, but just big picture, there are kind of two categories of soil um, that we will encounter. Um, there is the mineral soil, and that will consist of sands and clays. Um, and then there is also organic soil. Um, and so for the mineral soils, like sand, for example, what we'll see is this is like what we would picture as just like typical soil, like small rocks, like combined together, you zoom in and you see just a bunch of like little types of rocks and, and other types of minerals. Um, mixed together. So for sand, the ones that we see the most, especially in Florida, is going to be a quartz-based sand. Um, for clays, clays have a different structure, and they're much smaller than our sand. So if you zoom in on a microscope, it would look completely different, and you'd have to zoom in much more. But the two main mineralogies we see for clays are what we call kaolinite and what we call Montmor rollinite rollinite so that um these anything with an it generally you see like in um the mineral world like if if you're doing like an extensive project and they need to understand the, the mineralogy in it behind it for like the chemical structures or something anything with an it you can pretty much assume it's going to be a um a clay like structure so our quartz um is nice and easy because this gives us a specific gravity of 2.65. So if you remember in the materials class when we were um, doing different types of aggregates and everything, generally the specific gravities were around 2.65. If we're working with sands in this class, then you can assume that that specific gravity is going to be within the 2.65 because the majority of sand is gonna be a quartz base. So remember the specific gravity just as a refresher, this is the density of that solid divided by the density of water, or it's also equal to the unit weight of the solid divided by the unit weight of water. So it's a reference material um, and it's just a unitless value. So the specific, um, since quartz, like, you know, quartz crystals have a specific gravity of 2.65, you'll see the majority of the soil sandy soil will have a similar um, specific gravity because that's what it's made of. The clays on the other hand are a little bit different but still it should be between the 2.3 and the 2.9 range um, of specific gravity for clays. So generally you'll do an investigation at a site, you'll find where the clays or where the sands are, um, but, but then you could also encounter what we call organic material. Um, an organic material is usually much messier because it's composed of decay decaying plants or wood. It could also be composed of microorganisms. or even like bacteria and other stuff that will actually change over time, um, even like bugs. So this is important because all of this has a time aspect. So it could still be, you know, decomposing over time. So if you're putting a project on organic soils that is supposed to be there for 60 years, you know, what would that organic soil look like over that time period? But there's also um, a lot of physics, not only is there physical properties that we have to worry about, there's chemical 
and there's biological properties that we have to worry about. So for normally with sands and clays, we are worried about just the mineralogy, the structure of it, the physical, a little bit of the chemical side of things. If we encounter organic material, organic soils, then we have to worry about all of these. And that is why normally organic material is real bad. So if you're working in Florida, um, you'll encounter a lot of organic material and that's probably gonna be nine times out of 10 the hardest thing that your decision is going to be. It's like, do we try to improve the organic material? Do we remove the organic material? Or do we design around the organic material? Um, most of the time you'll be lucky and the organic material will be at the surface. So you can just remove that in areas um, like Orlando specifically. Some of these lakes are just filled with organic material and it could be organics down to like 200 feet below surface. So if you're trying to put a bridge over that lake, what type of foundation are you gonna to use to bypass that organic material? Or can you somehow suck it out or improve it? So this is a big area for research and a big area um, just for, for headaches, um, for geotechs, especially in Florida, uh, that you'll come across. So we'll see that um, most of the time too, there's going to be the mineral side, but it's going to be mixed with organics. And there's kind of three broad categories um, that you'll come across and that we'll talk about also within the class. But if you have something called with organics, so if the engineer says you have sand with organics or clay with organics, generally what we're talking about is less than 15% organics. Um, and these are all by mass, not by volume. So how they actually do it is they take a sample, they take the weight of the sample, and then they light the sample on fire, basically. So it's a really, really like, like strong source of, of heat. So all of the organic material will burn off and then they take the weight after, how much weight is lost is going to be the percent organics because they assume the quartz isn't going to burn off or any of the other minerals are gonna burn off. So if you see sand with organics, that's less than 15%, that's generally not bad. What you could also hear is muck. This is in between sand and what, or sand with organics. And then what we also call the upper extreme is peat. So if you hear peat, if you have a peaty soil, then that is greater than 75% of organics. And that is generally, if you encounter a peat material, then you're going to have to get rid of it. Like it's just, it's going to be compressible. You can't design they can't really hold any loads because of just the sheer amount of organic material in it and the amount of water and decaying matter. Um, so you'll see throughout this, for example, is FDOT's kind of rule. So if you work in Florida like, and you work on an FDOT, the Florida Department of Transportation, any roadways or bridges or public roads or anything, um, and then this is gonna be kind of their rule of thumb of defining what is considered what um, when it comes to organic material. So we'll talk more about this too um, whenever we get into um, the soil classifications and like the language, you know, uh, the terminology for geotechnical engineers. So um, back to uh, kind of the geology side of things. Um, as, we, as I showed in the first couple lectures, a big tool that you're gonna be utilizing as a geotech and working with um, the geologic or the geologist is um, the geologic maps. So again, they, these provide regional insight, not site specific insight. So this is just general trends uh, across the region or across the state. It provides insight on the rock type and the soil type um, within the project site at the ground surface. So that's an important thing to remember. This is only, the, some of these maps are only showing the type of formation or the type of soil and rock at that ground surface. And then obviously as a geotech, you're probably gonna have to do some investigations and determine what the layers are underneath it. Um, but the two informations that they give is, as we talked about before, the deposition. Don't do this. Deposition. That says deposition, one eye. All right, screw it. You guys know what I'm saying there. Deposition or formation. 
And again, this is what we talked about before. So examples of this would be like, oh, it's an alluvial deposition. Um, it is a glacial clay. It's a marine sand, something like that. So the geologic maps will actually tell us that deposition or formation type. And it will also tell us the composition. And again, these are all qualitative things. So there's no numbers assigned to it. And then it's up to us to assign the mechanics behind this. So the composition would be, uh, it is a shelly. Like is it, it's like they're, you're defining like what the soil is made of. Um, it's a primarily like quartz based alluvial deposit. Um, it's primarily clay or silty or sandy or any of these descriptive words that are just talking about what that material is made of. So you would include these geologic maps um, almost all the time in your site investigation for the client. So as we said before, like if Wawa was coming in, wanted you to do a site investigation for one of their new gas stations, you would look first at the geologic map understand what the general composition is in that area of Florida or whatever state you're working in. And then you would include and do the more comprehensive site investigation. But you almost always include these in here. And again, these are tools to anticipate potential geohazards we talked about before, sinkholes being a big one in Florida, uh, landslides, erosional susceptibility, high organics, that kind of stuff, um, especially the deposition. So the deposition gives us a good insight of what type of resources or what type of strength we may have based off of how that soil got there. So some of the ones in Florida that you've probably seen, um, if you've worked in that field, would look something like this. And again, they like to use bright colors and all sorts of stuff. But this is just showing the type of like soil formation that is at the surface. If you were to zoom in here, you would see all of the formation types. And you can see kind of maybe, maybe not, but you'll see the geologic ages as well. So not only will they tell you the composition and not only will they tell you the deposition type, but they'll tell you at what geologic age did that formation form. So as you can imagine, all the stuff on the East Coast here, down here, is pretty young, pretty new, because we have the Atlantic Ocean just keeping on feeding and taking away the sediment over there. Um, the elbow of Florida up here, if you remember that ridge that was there in the Miocene whenever Florida was sticking out, that was right here. And we can kind of see that illustrated by the color change there as well. So these geologic maps are gonna be something that you're going to um, definitely reference if you work and in, um, uh, geotechnical engineering in Florida. And the benefit too that they also have are is they provide these cross sections at the bottom. So not only do they show the, you know, the surface level, but also based off of this well data that they've accumulated over the years, they'll provide the cross section. So it would look something like this. So there's two main cross sections that we use and then also like different maps for like Florida or Jacksonville will use different types of cross sections. But we can see here like from basically Pensacola to Jack's Beach and then up here going down 75 to um, Miami. These would be the cross sections. And again, you see the same colors, the same color coordinating there, but now we see them with depth. Um, so let's zoom in at one of these. So this is the one for like kind of in, um, for our area, you know, right here. We are right here, right next to the St. John's River. You can see the St. John's River actually cuts into that Hawthorne formation, which is the TC. So we do get this here, that Hawthorne, that green is the Hawthorne. So you can see where that falls within Florida. You can see all the rivers here. The Suwannee River is cut there. That's this one that goes there. And then different types of rivers here, Apalachicola River, Chipola River, and all of those rivers that cut through it. And if you've ever driven like west on I-10, you've probably noticed it gets more hilly and you can see that is um, reflective in the map. Nice and flat, nice and flat in Florida. And then we start getting all these hills as the erosion process uh, changed me mechanisms. We go from a beach erosion to more of a river and an alluvial deposition um, as we go to the west.
So again, these are big scale things. Like we're talking about 600 feet deep. Most of the times, hopefully you're do, working on projects that don't require foundations to go 600 feet deep. You know, we're just going to the bedrock or going into um, a stiffer material like 100 feet or so. But it's still important to understand the, the general trend here um, of what to encounter. Um, again, like for an example, this layer right here is limestone and it's a pretty old limestone. So the older the sedimentary rock generally, the stronger it is. Um, so this layer, we may know where that depth to the limestone is in a certain area where this Hawthorn formation is, that's that weak material, that weak clay material. So right here in Gainesville, we actually have that Hawthorn layer missing and it's right on top of the, um, the uh, um, Swanee limestone. So generally in there, you know you will be hitting limestone directly and you won't actually hit that Hawthorne formation or something like that. Um, so you may choose a different type of investigation technique. You wouldn't go out there with an investigation technique that is better for, suited for clays or better suited for sands because you're just gonna be hitting rock right away. So this is a, again, example of why or how these maps would, um, would help you in your project um, as an engineer. So geologic maps, although they're important, there's two big things that they do not do um, that you we have to remember, like a big asterisk with geologic maps. Um, they do not provide details of the project site. So again, I talked about this before, they're regional only. So they just give you the general trends of the state or the region. So they can they should never replace a site investigation. So if the owner of Wawa wants you to design something at their project site, you can't just look at the geologic map and be like, okay, it's supposed to be this type of soil. We're good. Let's assume this foundation. You're always going to have to go to the project and site location and do testing to determine the subsoil investigation there. You can use the geologic map to equip your engineer, your field engineers, or you can use the geologic map to better understand the potential of the soil that you're going to hit. Um, but it can never be used as a like an end all be all situation with only looking at the geologic maps. Um, the other thing they do not provide that we'll see throughout the semester, there's no strength values. So again, it is qualitative only. All just looking at observations of how it got there, the age that it got there, what it's composed of. It tells us nothing about the strength of the material um, even the like erosion susceptibility, like what, how much uh, force of water, how, what the stress of water is that could keep the soil there. Nothing like math wise, nothing with numbers, nothing that we can use. So it's only observations. So this is why, sorry, this is why, go back, go back. This is why like eventually we need to use this to understand the mechanics of it. Again, the mechanics, we're talking about numbers and predictions. So if we understand how a soil will react under certain loading, and we can understand the mechanical behavior of it, then we can estimate how it will react under future loading. So we can then understand if we put a 2000 ton building on top of this, we know that it will react a certain way. It will deform this much. It will have the potential of failing X, Y, Z, all that stuff that we'll see throughout the semester. So yeah, um, this is just a dumb cartoon to end it. The scientists and math, there's a big difference between these. You'll, as an engineer, you'll work a lot with geologists and geophysicists, and we all need to work together, although we all speak different languages and see it differently. The more effectively we can communicate, uh, the better it'll be for the client who will hire you know, all three of you at the same time. Um, so that's it, guys. Next week, we'll talk more about soil composition and properties.
When I say next week, I mean two days from now.